looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the theme of chapter number two of the book of Acts, specifically in verse 24, what we will be looking this morning. And it's right on the heels of the crucifixion in verse 23, then the resurrection in 24. But I want to start off going to 2 Peter chapter 1 to start off today. 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 12 says, Wherefore, remember there's a, a wherefore, the wherefore is because of the great salvation we have in the previous, the previous verses. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. That present truth is the reality of salvation by grace through faith, through the finished work of Jesus Christ and His shed blood. Verse number 13, Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir, stir you up by putting you in remembrance. That's why we need to be gospel-focused. The finished work of Christ-focused is where we need to be even today knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. He told them he was going to die on behalf. Imagine somebody, people go to prophecies and everything, prophets today, looking for good news that they're going to get rich and healthy. But the promise that Peter had is, you're going to be putting off this tabernacle. You're going to die for my, my sake. That was the hope that he had wasn't in his best life. Now his hope was in the resurrected Savior and the future glorification of his body. Nonetheless, verse number 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables or tales. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. See, during the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, Peter was right there as an eyewitness to the glory that took place. He had a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of the kingdom of God on earth just for that time. But, verse number 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and, and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And Lord, we just pray that you would add your blessing to your word this morning. And it's in, in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I want to point out something. If you've been following along in, in Peter's sermon on the, on the day of Pentecost, starting in Acts chapter 2, 14 and following, Peter did something that's, that's drastically missing even today. He expounded Scripture. Right. Remember he talked about what was going on? This was like as Joel. Now de dealing with the resurrection, he's going to be looking at the prophecies of David. You say, wait a minute, David, was he really a prophet? Well, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter made him a prophet because he declared the kingdom of God, or the, the kingdom, his kingdom, that would be, that would be settled, and a, one of his, his heirs would reign, and that heir is none other than Jesus Christ. So Peter doesn't just take his own experience for what he's going to bring, but he takes the testimony of Scripture. See, it's important, no matter what you believe, 
We might even believe something historical that may or may not be true, but it all has to come from what does the Bible say? This is for the believer today. We have a complete, sufficient revelation of God through the 66 books of the Bible. Sort of reminds me of three old, old gals. They were going to a, a doctor at the same time. They were going to have a, 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 a test to, to see how their reasoning was, a cognitive reasoning test. So the three of them were together there, and the first lady gets up, and the doctor says, we're going to start the test Here's the question. What is three times three? The woman said, 297. To which the doctor just kind of shrugged. And he went on to the next lady. So that he went to the second lady and he says, what is three times three? Without, a, without any hesitation, she said, Friday. So again, the doctor shrugged. Doctor shrugged and he went to the third woman. He says, Ma'am, can you answer this question for me? What is three times three? She blurted out immediately, nine! To which the doctor said, Wow. He was relieved. Now can you tell me how you could you how you came to this this answer? She says, I just subtracted Friday from 297. <laughs> See, she came to the right conclusion, but she had the wrong way of coming to that conclusion. How she did it, I don't know. It's, it's new speak, I guess you call it today. But there is a right way and a wrong way of dealing with prophecy, dealing with the Scriptures, and the right way is to take a historic, literal interpretation and apply that. And that's what Peter does in the book of Acts. So he's taken this, this historical representation that he had from the Old Testament, and he's bringing that to light into this new dispens dispensation of grace that we're in. Salvation by grace through faith. And that's how it's brought. Jesus Christ is the very focus, the very essence of both the Old and New Testament. Never forget that. If I had a map back here, I'd show a quick little, little detail. If you look to the past, you're looking unto the law. If you're looking to the future, you're looking unto judgment and the law. The time of the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, will be a time of judgment, bringing the nation of Israel back to where they were supposed to be as a kingdom of priests forever. That was the role of the of the of the Jews starting in the very beginning of the Bible. Now we have a spot in the middle. That spot we have in the middle is the spot we're in right now. That is the age of grace. We're now no longer under that law, and we're not under judgment. Because Jesus Christ took that judgment for us, and He fulfilled the law. So today, in the age we're in, the age of grace, all one has to do is believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that He died, was buried, and resurrected on your behalf. Amen? Amen. So at that, let's turn to Acts chapter 2. And again, I think this is part 18 of the, the next... Uh, maybe 50 or 60 weeks in the book of Acts, the way it's going. <laughs> so I don't think we're going to get out of chapter, verse number 24. Acts chapter, oh, it would help if I were there. I want to go back a couple verses. I'm going to go back one more. How's that? Verse number 21. In fulfillment of the message of Joel, the nation, there were some looking forward to the kingdom of God, but most would reject that kingdom. Now we have what's happening during this judgment in the kingdom to come. It says, and it shall come to pass 
that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Just think, that's good for today. That's good enough during that time of tribulation where people will be going under those trials, the nation of Israel especially, but God gives a way out. Just call on the name of the Lord. You'll be rescued. That's simple. That's good in the past dispensation. It's good in the future dispensation. And it's good right now as well. Verse number 22 says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So they had the proof of Jesus' miracles taking place that he was the Messiah, yet he was rejected. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Remember we saw that this determinate counsel wasn't a scope of who could be saved, but it's a, the determinate counsel was the measure by which one could be saved. The uttermost limits of salvation would be through the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Acts 4.12, there's no other name under heaven by which a man must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way. We have, uh, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. There was that Good Friday, or whatever your view is on which day Jesus was crucified. He was there. It was God's plan that Jesus would lay down His life for the sins of His people. Now we turn to verse 24. It says, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because, because it was not possible that He should be holden of it. I think that's as far as we're going to get this morning, by the way. The, the resurrection... The resurrection meant victory over death, both physical death and spiritual death. There's no other way that shows the victory that Christ was. Whom God hath raised up. Well, who is God? Jesus is also God. So under the power of the whole trinity of, of God, Jesus was raised up. The very creator of the universe... This God incarnate man, not a man, but God and man at the same time, could not be overcome by his own creation. Think of that, how people still try to do that today. We're going to try to get God to move. We're going to, we're going to go all the way around the cross of Jesus Christ because we need to find some other way to do it. It's foolishness to those who believe but it is the wisdom of this world that puts so much on human knowledge and human understanding. Humanism has put man in the place of God. You don't even have to call it secular humanism anymore. You can call it Christian humanism, where self is put up on a platform. What can God do for me? What, what riches can I receive? What glory can I receive? Well, as we saw... What was Peter's promise? It was a promise of death. I know I always like New Hampshire's slogan, live free or die. Well, guess what? That's true. We have no other place to go in our human humanity, human humanity, yeah, right, in our human nature, but to the grave or upward with Christ. There's no, there's no in-betweens. There's no purgatory. There's no other thing that can satisfy God's judgment and justice except the cross of Jesus Christ. God cannot be taken place of. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. And even as those same religious and political leaders in Jesus' day thought they had overcome God Himself by crucifying Christ and putting Him in, into a sealed grave, we do the same today. Jesus doesn't know. He doesn't know our secrets. 
He doesn't know what we're thinking. Yes, he does. He knows everything. God is the victor. When that stone was rolled away, it showed there was no higher power, no other power than that of God himself. That stone was rolled away not because it took care of your financial issues. It wasn't the stone of finances. It was a literal stone that was taken out of the day that could not contain God incarnate. Think of that. The creator of the universe. Try to box him up into a grave. It's impossible. The one who calmed the wind and the waves. The one who literally holds the world by his hand, and you think you're going to defeat him. No such luck. No such thing that can happen. God is the victor. Jesus Christ is the victor. We can truly sing, faith is the victor. Victory. Oh, by the way, I was going to... We had a fire going last night getting rid of some old junk that we had. And I, took, I grabbed an old chair that had fallen apart. Did you ever have a chair just drop down on you? Well, we had a bunch of them. We used to play Russian roulette with our chairs in the house. <laughs> See, who's going to get the one that's got the leg that's about to break? Yeah, it, uh, it really does happen. But there was one, I, I took a picture of it, and The middle was falling out, a leg was sideways, and I asked everybody, I said, would you sit on that chair? I didn't get any takers for it. Tim, I asked you if you'd sit on that chair, right? You didn't do it, right? Oh, you were probably... Everybody that was near the fire, I asked. I wouldn't... Nobody would take that. They saw that it was a falling apart chair that as soon as you put any kind of weight at all on it, it was going to collapse. That's what so much of the religious systems are today. They're falling apart chairs. But remember, faith has to have an object. The object of one's faith when he sits down, not even thinking of it, is that chair that he's sitting on. I never used to check them, but I always check underneath nowadays. The very object of our faith. We can't have faith in just faith. Faith needs an object. It is Jesus Christ. How could you have any other object to have faith in? Many run around today, they think they have faith in faith. Their faith, that their work that they do can overcome anything. They can even create their own reality through their faith-filled words. It's pure nonsense. But people love to have that kind of offer of power when in fact that we are powerless over all those things. We're powerless. What is it? What's his name there in Texas? Kenneth Copeland. He, he believes that he can change the weather, but he won't fly in a storm. I heard him say that. I won't fly in a storm. Why not? If you can tell the storm to go away, fly in it. That's the reality. That's an extreme thing, but that's the reality. We do the same thing when we put our trust in anything else. We tend to look at our own selves. We look in a mirror. Am I doing good enough? The answer is no. You're not doing good enough. No matter how hard you try, without the finished work of Jesus Christ, you're going to fall flat on your face. I try to be a good person. I try to be a good Christian. Well, you're going to end up failing for all that trying. You need to trust in the complete work of Jesus He was the creator of the universe, God incarnate. How could death or a measly little thousand pound stone hold him in place? That's the great Jesus we have. He came out of that tomb. He was alive. Not only was he alive, he is alive today. What a miracle that is. He's alive, seated at the right hand of the Father. He came to be king, was rejected. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's fulfilling the office of priest there, praying 
on your behalf. And for our part, He sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, not come upon us, and our spirits agree with Him together. It doesn't get any better than that. Amen? Amen? Let's, look, let's go back to our text here in verse 24. Whom God has raised up. I love this part. Having loosed the pains of death. These pains that are talked about here, it's, it's a, a Greek word only used just in, in like five different places in the New Testament. Literally, it is odin. You could say that. Think of Jethro, Bodin, and think of odin. Odin is the word. Literally may, means birth pangs. Literally, literally pain to the point of birth. We don't have to go in too much into the scriptures about that. But in the book of John 16, 16 through 22. Let's go there. I wasn't going to go there. I was going to close with this verse. I always like to give the, the closing in the middle somewhere. So. Verse 16, he's addressing his disciples in the, here. He says, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. He's going, and he's coming back again. This, is not, this isn't dealing with the first resurrection. This is dealing when Christ comes again. We'll see him again. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. We have the benefit, of, the benefit today of knowing the rest of the story. They didn't. They were literally clueless as to what was going on, even when Jesus told them. They said, therefore, What is this that he saith? A little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? They're like mystified now. How did he know? He's God. He knew what they were talking about right there. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep, and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. If you go back in the later pa uh, passages, the later chapters of the book of Isaiah, we see a lot of that sorrow turned to joy. Dawn, uh, or, or sorrow turned to laughter, and all these different things are all pointing to the coming kingdom of God on earth. There'll be a day, they'll have joy when they see Him again. During the Last Supper, they said, some of you won't see me again until I drink anew with you in the kingdom of heaven. He was coming back and he would one day sup with them. What verse was I on here? Verse 21. A woman, when she is in travail, this is Odin, this is this great pain of childbirth. When she was in, in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour has come. Now, I've never been pregnant, but I know people who have been, and it's a time of most agony and pain. Isn't it not? I get an amen on that one from, from the ladies. It is a time you would never wish on anybody you knew. But look at what happened. But as soon as she is delivered of the child... She remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Amen. I've been there. I've been in several times in the, the labor and delivery room, going through the pain and the anguish and the crying and, the, and all those other things. And then as soon as the baby is born, they take, the doctor takes that baby and immediately there's tears of joy. 
mom right there on the delivery table doesn't even think of the agony that she just went through. Oh, it settles in later, but... <laughs> she doesn't think that. All she can know is that this newborn babe is now in her arms. It was worth it. The agony, the, the, the pain, it was worth it for that child to come into the world. Now, when they get to be teenagers, you start questioning that, but... <laughs> But it was worth it. Let me finish out a couple more verses here. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow. You're going through the anguish now. You're going through the time of, I am departing, I'm leaving this world, and you have sorrow in your hearts right now. But, listen to these words, I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice in your joy no man taketh from you. I was going to end like that, but let's finish the chapter. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. See, in that time when Christ returns, when they see him again in the kingdom anew, they will have perfect peace, perfect harmony, perfect minds with Christ. They won't be asking him for a Mercedes Benz or a Lexus or anything like that. They'll have this perfect knowledge of who Jesus is when they see him on that day takes it always gets me another one taking this verse out of context trying to apply it today there's that other dispensation there there's that tribulation and going through that tribulation and coming afresh into the kingdom of God they won't have any desires to have worldly things they will their mind what's that song stayed upon Jehovah their minds will be fixed on Christ and what He's done in, in His coming kingdom. And in that day ye shall ask Me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in My name, He will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in My name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Amen. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. There's another gospel message right there for today as well. There's no other way. He said, you've loved me, and so you have the love of the Father. You can love your own works. You can love any kind of religion, but is it a love of Jesus? And do you understand that Christ came and He loved you first so that you can love Him? Loving Buddha, loving Allah, loving all these different things will not get you anyway. This is the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Praise the Lord. If we go back to John, to John chapter 14, He's in with the Father. He's preparing a place for you. What did He say? If I go, I will... I will... Let's go back there. 14.1. <laughs> John 14.1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there ye may be also and whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Amen. We're going to go through verse 6 and 7. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am 
You know, you can cut that right off right there. I am the very God, the very Elohim, the very Lord of all. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. See how exclusive Jesus is? There's no other way except through Jesus. Again, the little kid singing last week still rings true. There's no other way to God except for Jesus Christ. He satisfied the Father's wrath. He satisfied His judgment upon the world. And He satisfies our salvation, our sanctification, and our glorification as well. He is enough. He is complete. Verse number, uh, verse number 7, If ye had known Me, ye should have known My Father also, and from henceforth ye know Him, and have seen Him. If you've seen Jesus, we don't see Him today physically. We see Him through God's revelation, through His Word. We don't see Him in dreams and visions and all kinds of wacky things like that. We see Him through the Word. That's the point of Peter's testimony at first. We have a more sure word of prophecy. If it was good enough, the Word of God, especially the Old Testament in Peter's time, was enough for a revelation of who Jesus Christ was. It's enough for us today. Amen. A couple places. Do I want to go back to chapter 16? Yeah, let's go back to 16. We'll finish that up. Verse 29 says, His disciples said unto Him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speaketh no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needeth not that any, any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. See, the plain truth was what they heard, and that's what they got. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and ye shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Right. You know what happened with all of them at the cross? They were nowhere to be found. Right. They ran away from what was taking place on Calvary. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me, in me ye might have Peace. Remember that old bumper sticker, no Jesus, no peace, no Jesus, no peace. In Him is peace. Even through the tribulation, even through the scattering, He would still be their peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's a chair I can sit on. That's a chair I don't check to see if the legs are going to fall out on. This is a, a chair that we can put our full faith in, in the words of Christ, that He is who He said He, he was. Did that come out right? Let's go to uh, Matthew 24 for a second. Matthew 24. Again, I always have to put the disclaimer. The Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 25, and 26 deals primarily with the, the time of Jacob's trouble. It deals primarily with the time of tribulation when the nation of Israel is in focus, when he comes to establish his kingdom. So I always have to put that out because other people say, no, that's the church. The church is going to go through tribulation. Oh, I'm going, to, I'm going to look to Christ rapturing the church before the tribulation begins. Amen. Matthew chapter 24, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to skip around a few verses just to get, get through this. 
Verse number four. <laughs> How can I do this? I can't. I cringe when I hear people taking one verse and then saying that's about me. No. Verse number one. <laughs> And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Who was with him? The disciples were with him. What were they showing him? They, were show, they departed from the temple. They were in a different dispensation. They weren't, aren't in the dispensation of grace that's coming here. They were looking at the judgment of the nation of Israel. That They're looking at the kingdom of God to come. And Jesus said unto him, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he was definitely talking about 70 A.D. when the Romans conquered Jerusalem and, and ransacked the place. And there you could see, and, and I saw this, it was, my eyes were just opened up to this. You look at the book of Hebrews and tie it in about that same time. And look and see who the book of Hebrews deals with. Who is it named after? The Hebrews deals with them during tribulation. How to withstand tribulation by standing upon Christ. Verse number four, three. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now again, this is primarily for the Jews. The Antichrist will be on the scene deceiving. People will be, in, be, will, will be being deceived at that time by great lying signs and wonders. But he says, don't be deceived. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Again, this has been happening since. The apostles were off the scene. Acts chapter 28, before Paul was departing, before he was going, moving on to being with the Lord, he left the Ephesian church. The elders there said, as soon as, after my departing, grievous wolves will come. So this is true of all the time now. There's many people deceiving people, claiming to be Christ. Believe it or not, there are many people everywhere that claim to be Christ. Tony Robbins, if you ever follow him at all, motivational speaker, he thinks he's a Christ. I kind of joked, I kind of cracked up a few years ago when he burned himself while walking on fire. He has demonic power. And uh, once in a while, that demonic power will get you burned, and it literally did. He burned his feet while walking on fire. Don't try that at home, by the way. You do not have the ability to walk on fire unless you're demon-possessed, as people like him are. But it comes back to bite you. I don't know how I get into Tony Robbins, but... Verse number, verse number 6, And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass... But the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places, just like prophesied by Joel and Hosea and all the Old Testament prophets. They're coming as a judgment upon the, the nation of Israel to bring them back into the kingdom and the covenant promises to Abraham and David. That's the simplicity of it. And if, it, if you didn't think it was so sim simple, let me know. I'd love to talk about that. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Or Odin, the birth pangs. The first part of the tribulation will be bad. And this could be ramped up more and more through the tribulation until further on in Matthew 24, except, except those days be shortened for the elect's sake. There would be no flesh saved. The elect of the nation of Israel, who he's going to preserve and bring back into the land. Now, I do want to stop there, but I, you know. Verse number 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations of my name's sake. And then, 
shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. What was one of the signs that 2 Timothy chapter 4 talks about? Men will be lovers of self. No care one for another. I love it when I see people just naturally just start caring for one another. Because by nature, we're children of wrath. By nature, we're spoiled, we're sinful, we're selfish. But when you start growing in Christ, He changes you in that regards. Not because of you trying to do so, but merely, not merely, but because of His great grace and mercy. Let me finish up here. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Again, it's talking about the tribulation here, but we can see the same thing happening today. The love of many wax cold. People hear about murders taking place. It's like another, just another day in paradise, isn't it? Just another day, another slaying, another killing, another offense. 50 some odd million aborted babies every year. Well, it's just another day in the life of the country, isn't it? People are getting waxing cold even today throughout the world. No care about life, no care about truth, no care about justice. And one day there's going to be this Antichrist and his minions. They're going to come into the world singing Kumbaya. And the world will be a better place. Just follow me. I will lead you into life. The same old lie that happened in the Garden of Eden. The same old lie that's been being, being perpetrated or perpetuated. I think they both were perpetrated and perpetuated from history. Same old liars will take over the world and they'll draw people unto themselves rather than to Christ. See, verse 13, and here's where is where it's important that we recognize, as I said, this is for the tribulation days, this isn't for the Christian today. It says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Amen. Yes, Christian, you don't have to go through the tribulation. God promises the church to be rescued before the tribulation happens. Amen. But those who don't believe, especially unbelieving people of the nation of Israel, they will go through tribulation. They will be martyred. They will be persecuted. But yet, if you endure, you'll be saved or rescued. But even in the midst of that, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. What a promise that is. Even if you're martyred during this time for your faith, you'll be with the saints, the tribulation saints, all together gathered around the throne of God. Amen. I'm just so I'm going to close it up here. I think, and I only get about halfway, which I was think where I thought I'd get to today. But it's just incredible. The things going to be happening in this world, the Christian has no part in. The trials are going. Trials always come. We all have tribulation, but this time of the great tribulation is not for the believer. We're in the age of grace. Be taken out before that tribulation starts. Let's close with verse 14 here in Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom. See, we're not, we don't have the gospel of the kingdom today. We have the everlasting gospel. It's a gospel of grace today. But the gospel of the kingdom will be taught. There'll be 144,000 Jewish virgins. There's a miracle right there. 12,000 from every tribe that will be there. There'll be some, some say they won't be prophesying. Some say they will, but they will be witnesses to the glory and the grace of God. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The age of the Gentiles will be ended. There'll be no more hope for the people of the world that remain, because the tribulation will come in its fullest fury in the last half of it. 
But today, there is an escape. As, I almost said Moses, as Noah, as he was shutting the door, well, actually, he didn't shut the door. Him and his family got in, and God shut the door of that ark. It sounds like it was nasty. Couldn't there have been just one more person that could have come upon that ark? Perhaps there was. It's only speculation that there were people knocking at the door to get in. But it was too late. The door had been closed. The age of grace that we're in today is going to come to an end. The door will be closed on people being raptured. And then those that are left will have to endure tribulation. Sadly, there will be blindness in the world too, that people will love their own works rather than Christ. But those who believe and endure during that time will be saved. But for us, we sit here by the mercy of God, by the grace of God. And as I always like to say, it doesn't matter if you're a believer or if you're a non-believer. The only answer is the gospel. The gospel of grace, not the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of grace that Jesus Christ was enough. He suffered, died, was buried, he rose again according to the Scripture. And getting back to the beginning, and what, what He did was witnessed by many. And it was attested to through the Bible we have today. Amen? Amen. Trust Christ. Whether you have done it, accepted the gift of salvation, now is that accepted time. Amen. Now is the day of salvation. If you've been a believer for 100,000 years, trust Christ. That's where everything falls. And not what you and I do, but in what He did already on our behalf. People always ask me, well, what should we do? Well, it all goes back. It could be circular logic. I said, believe the Gospel. Well, how am I going to further myself in the kingdom? Don't look to furthering yourself in the kingdom. That'll come on its own. Trust Christ. Grow in Him. Grow. Even Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, 18, says, no, chapter 3, verse 18, says to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our call today. The grace and knowledge of Christ. Amen? God is good. God is powerful. That the very one who holds the universe by his outstretched palm cares enough that he would send his son in a form of a man to humble himself and suffer, bleed, and die on the cross is just so amazing. The weight of sin was upon him. Every sin. Think of that. Try counting your own sins. Can't do it. They're innumerable. Then add that to all the six billion or so people in the world. Christ died for every single one of those. Amen? God is good. He's great. It almost sounds like another song there. He is great. Let us, let us make much of Him and what He did. And that's what will get us through and others as well who believe that. Amen? Let's stand together.